Hello, everybody out there in the internet world, the interwebs. It's the data doctors kind of coming together again to uh, answer Q&A questions. Got the whole team, got the crew here. You can see there, Ken, Brandon, Michael, Sam. Brandon and I, for many, 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 many years, did a call-in radio program that, uh, gosh, it's been eight or nine years? How long has it been? It's been a few years since, uh, since the, the old day radio stuff, but uh, here we are. Yeah, we did that for almost 18 years, every weekend, call-in program. So we thought, you know, with everything going on out there, we've got a lot of people sitting around trying to get entertainment and education. And we always entertainment, right? We always build our radio show as edutainment because we like to have fun. Technology can be a little dry in the wrong hands. So we try to make it fun. So if you've got any kind of tech questions whatsoever, that's really what we thought we'd do is just pop up here um, and just allow anybody to ask any questions you have, whether you're watching on Facebook or if you're watching on YouTube, either one, if you just post your question uh, in those platforms, we should see them. Uh, we may ask for clarification, but we'll do our best to try to uh, provide you with information. And for some reason, we either don't have the information or want to do some more research because, we'll the, yeah, we can, we can after the, the, uh, the live stream is over, we can do a little research, we can get back to you. So any question you post, whether we answer it during the live stream or not, at some point, we will make sure and provide you some, some guidance. So um, Mike, uh, has been with us and works uh, operationally in uh, in the stores. So he's working with a lot of consumers. Um, so, uh, but I mean, small business consumer, we, we all kind of work with the same group of people. Whereas Sam tends to be the guy that goes out to the businesses, goes out to the home. So we're trying to bring together uh, kind of a cross of the, the various folks that are in our organization that can maybe help answer these questions. And of course, Brand, Brandon's my business partner and the CTO, the CIO. We call him the alpha geek in our, uh, in our world. <laughs> Those guys, uh, by the way, you can tell Mike and Sam apart really easily. One has long hair. One does not. Which one, <laughs> which one's which I, I always get them confused. Uh, you know what? Luckily names are right there for people. So it's easy. Yeah, I'm totally Mike, by the way. Hi, I'm yeah, Sam. Totally. <laughs> Brothers from another mother. There it is. We've already, we've already got three questions posted. Like we've been in here minutes and here we go. So awesome. Well, I mean, listen, people, you know, we've done this forever. People people always have questions with their technology and, you know. But this format, this is different. By the way, we're in four different places. We're, we're being distant. We're all in our homes. So excuse the miscellaneous noises you might hear in the background. We all have... <laughs> families we all have pets we all have things that happen so we understand uh hopefully you understand too well if you hear a lot of zooming coming from brandon he's on his houseboat so don't <laughs> feel bad for him <laughs> <laughs> hey listen so chris golda has this uh, question i was thinking of getting the wd western digital cloud drive is this a good product anybody want to chime in on that sure yeah um i've uh at the store, I have a, a client that um, asked to have one put in, and um, they they're they're good products. They do exactly what what you would think they would. They they give you a lot of storage in one spot. The storage can be accessible from the outside world if you need to. Um, the issue that's not instantly apparent is that. This is sort of like what we in this world called a NAS or NAS, it's network attached storage. So this drive basically sits by your router and connects to the router via an ethernet cable. Okay, right, so. Before you go on, let me see if I can break this down a little bit for you. Yep. For people listening, this means that this device doesn't physically plug into any of the computers you have, which is probably what you were thinking it did, right? Because when you right. buy a solar slide, you expect it to plug into a computer, but instead this plugs into your network, meaning your like home, all your home devices can see it, which you think is a good thing, which it is, but the downside to that is there's a speed issue with speed of access, speed of backup, speed of everything. And so 
it's it's intended to be a backup device, not a storage regular usage device, right? Correct. Correct. And and, the, yeah, and, has, you can access it from outside of your house too, very easily without having to know any kind of tech stuff, uh, which is a, generally a good thing. There can be some downside to that, but generally that, that's a good thing too. So yeah, from a tech savvy standpoint, let's call it a one to ten scale. Somebody that basically do they have to be fairly technical to be able to make this device work? What we found is that it's it's a little different than you might expect, and that you have to create users in with some of the, the the app, the Western Digital app, to properly talk to and access. Um, and so there is, I would say, on a on a one to ten, this is probably more like a six on tech scale as far as complexity and getting it configured and set up right. So it's not really necessarily plug and play. And they're not cheap either, are they? They're pretty expensive. They're more expensive than, yeah, than just picking up a, a standard external drive. Yep. Yeah. So if you don't need the access from the outside world, a much simpler, much easier thing to set up would be just a regular, what they call a passport in the Western Digital Series, or Seagate has its own name, but they're basically an external hard drive that you plug into a USB. It gives you the storage you're looking for. It gives you the ability to back up, but doesn't have the complexity of setup. Again, if you don't care about the cloud issue, the ability to access it from outside your home network, then that may be the way to go. Right. Well, you're paying for a lot of that. But Chris, Chris, if you want to give us a little more clarification on what you're looking for in a backup device, that might help us as well. I mean, for general purposes, for those of you out there that are you know, thinking about well, what's the best way to kind of deal with this, we really, really try to get people to think in terms of the three, two, one backup approach. That is three copies of your critical data on at least two different devices with one of those backups being offsite. So essentially how that plays out for most people is you have your computer, you have that local hard drive, little backup drive like the passport or something like, like what Brandon was talking about. And then the third element would be something like Carbonite where you basically have all of that stuff offsite which protects you from ransomware and a bunch of other issues. You know, it's great to have a backup drive in your home next to your computer. Somebody breaks in and steals your computer and they're going to probably going to take your backup drive. If you get hit with ransomware, they're going to hit that backup drive. If you have a fire, flood, any of those kind of things, you have no protection there, which is where that third layer that that offsite backup comes in. So hopefully that helps out. Again, Chris, if you want to give us more clarity on that, um, that might help us help you specifically. How about Becca? She says, I keep having a key on my Mac that I have to hit two or three times to work. And then in a week or so, it switches to another key. It sounds like she's having some keyboard issues. So first, I'm going to say, can you pull back up Becca's question? Because that profile picture, I'm pretty sure is not Becca. Not an expert, but I'm guessing it's not Becca. Why? <laughs> anyway. Uh, There's a simile say, of Becca. No, a simile of Becca. It's an emoji, you know, an emoji, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, a key getting stuck. Lots of different possibilities there, right? Yeah. Yeah, what we tend to see in the stores, we see a lot of MacBooks come in. And when they're having keyboard issues, um, many times it's because there was the tiniest bit of liquid spilled into the keyboard. You were maybe, you know, a glass of water or something and set it down, got a little splash. It doesn't take more than a couple few drops and keys will start going crazy. Working, sometimes not working, sometimes working again, um, which can happen because water will evaporate or maybe leak over to a, to a different key area and evaporate from one. So it can be intermittent and it's hard to chase down. Um, but if you don't think it's that, that you swear that you've never spilled liquid anywhere, then um, it, you know, it could just be a, a keyboard problem, specifically electronically. Yeah, it depends on the age of the device, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. it's old enough, the keyboard can act. I mean, it's it's a fairly, I mean, it's it's something that will wear out in some cases. Yep. Um, food too, right? Depending oh, upon. Yeah. Depending yep. upon if you, you know, I mean, we're in a pandemic, right? People are eating at their keyboard <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. By the way, the way Way just too many grains you of rice on the keyboards before. I was gonna say, I challenge everyone out there to take their keyboards, turn them upside down, Ew. Just, run your, just run your finger over the keys. Ew. Just see how much stuff falls out of those things. No, <laughs> a lot of human will fall out. Yeah, no. but 
but I mean, you start with the simple stuff, right? For Becca, right. just try to see if any of that works. Uh, you got compressed air or something like that. Just blow all the keys out. See if that helps at all. But um, otherwise, depending upon the, the age of the device, it may be, you know, maybe that you have to replace the keyboard. So, yeah, so you can do you, you can yeah, plug in an external keyboard and see like a USB wired keyboard and see if you have the same issues. If you do not, then it's we're, we're now talking about a keyboard problem. Most likely, if you're still having the identical issues with a wired keyboard, you probably are talking about a logic board or motherboard problem at that point. Hey, uh, Becca's on right now, and she put a couple of updates in there. I don't know if you guys are watching, but she put virus, question mark, question mark, and then why does it switch around? So she, what she's asking is, is it possible this is malware in her Mac? Set, set aside the Mac issue for a question. So let's set, set, that, set that aside for a sec. And also, why does it keep moving? So it it's key one, but then it switches to key two. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue that's moving around. I think we touched on a little bit. It's an older keyboard, maybe. Um, there could be a short just because you didn't spill something on it, by the way, doesn't mean right. that somebody else that you live with didn't or yep. that a who gross didn't spill on it. So, right. A lot no, of true. Yeah, that it's very possible. Malware can cause that kind of behavior. Well, and um, here's the thing that we hate the worst, right? Intermittent issues. Oh, yeah. Because how do you know you fixed it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those yeah, kill my brain. On a regular basis. It yeah. is. It's yeah. one of the biggest challenges we all have, right? All right, here's one that I know a million people are dealing with. <laughs> Every time I get a Windows 10 update, within <laughs> half an hour, I can reboot a half dozen times before I have a permanent cable connection. No right. Why? Why? Why, Microsoft? Why are you doing this to us? I would say that lately, seven out of ten of my house calls are due to uh, I won't I won't call them botched, but definitely uh, ineffective Windows 10 updates. Um, with those, I mean, we, we we have a couple of different options. We can uninstall the update and roll it back if we're able to access the computer. Uh, the uh, the more likely option though is we've got to wait a little bit. We can push through more updates if they're available or pending, uh, but sometimes we actually have to wait for Microsoft to release a fix for that. Um, that's definitely something that uh, on-site comes across on a regular basis. So those of you that have a mission critical situation and you're, on, you're using Windows machines, you may not know that there's a difference, but there's a Windows Pro version for Windows 10. And you actually do have controls over whether the updates install or not. So if you're out there and you're dealing with challenging situations and you have this mission critical machine, uh, switching up to or upgrading to Windows 10 Pro does give you that ability to say, don't automatically install. For the rest of you, Windows 10 is going to do what it does. And, you know, Mike, how many, how many, what percentage of the machines you see coming in these days have a Windows 10 update issue? Oh, I would say probably at least half of them. And, you know, that's Microsoft's putting out two large major updates a year and then all the in-between ones and as a matter of fact just so everyone is aware today was the first day of one of the large ones being pushed out we saw it throughout the store today many many of the machines that we were servicing wanted to apply that feature update so we're going to see that kind of behavior that mike's talking about with the big ones especially right where it, it takes a long time to get it and a lot of times as a user, you don't know you're getting it. It's coming down in the background. You're wondering why your machine's slow. You can't get to your internet sites. What's going on? And if during that time you think something's up with the computer and you restart it, well, when it comes back up, it picks up in the background where it left off, hopefully. And, you know, when it's done, it asks you to reboot and that kind of thing. So Windows updates have probably turned into one of the the biggest ongoing issues we see on a regular basis on on many many machines is there anything yeah. that people can be doing manually as far as updates go like no with windows 10 they've really locked things down they've opened up a, a little bit to pausing them if you need to for some period of time but in general they've really locked it in to where you need to take what they're offering at the time it comes by the way, if you think that Windows 10 maybe should be avoided because of what he's talking about, let's talk about the alternative, which is staying on what's now an unsupported operating system in the past, 
how many people are we seeing in our stores with that issue where they've, they, they've tried to hold out as long as they can. Mm-hmm. Now they're stuck and they're having other issues. Like I, I, as, as much as it sounds negative, what Mike is talking about, it's better than the alternative, which is staying in the past and trying to fight that off as long as you can. Yep. And it, with the issue that's only going to get worse. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and one of the biggest issues of that is that it is a potential security problem. And that's what we're trying to stay away from completely. We want to protect our data. We want to protect our identity, you know? And so going forward with an operating system that is no longer supported um, because there might be a little pain going forward um, is probably not the best option in the long run. Definitely so, fear of the unknown there for sure is what I come across uh, when I'm when I'm based or when I'm faced with a client that is dealing with upgrading the Windows 10 from Windows 7, they've been used to that operating system for so long now um, that it's like second nature to them. And when we throw them something completely aesthetically different, like Windows 10, there's there's a lot of fear that comes with that. And uh, and I have this conversation with clients all the time, business clients too, still to this day who are holding on to dear life for Windows 7. Um, what would you rather? Would you rather deal with this little bit of an aesthetic difference and get through this fear, or would you rather be completely, you know, open to security risks and yeah. people accessing your data? You know, uh, some people don't understand what those security risks are, and uh, basically, what it comes down to is uh, Microsoft is no longer supporting any security patching for Windows Seven, right? So if somebody in, in some basement somewhere finds a backdoor into Windows Seven somehow some way they're not going to do anything about it you're no longer going to have those fixes so yeah. uh, i'm i'm pro windows 10 absolutely and windows 10 pro well and we've written extensively about how to make windows 10 look and feel like windows 7 so anybody out there that's fearing that if you need help on that we've published all kinds of stuff we can direct you towards uh that, that kind of stuff to see if that kind of helps you kind of get through that transition it's only a strange operating system during that transition time so yep. hey, be- before we move on to Donna's question, real quick, Mike and Sam, because you're dealing with people on a regular daily basis, people that you've taken from the old Windows 7 to Windows 10 that were hesitant after you've gotten them there, what's the reaction you generally get? Um, yeah, that's that. I was I was hoping you somebody would actually ask that. Um, the The reality is that when you think about the similarities of 10 and 7, rather than differences, they're all there. There's a taskbar on the bottom. There's a start menu on the in the button in the lower left. There's a desktop with your icons. All of that is there. It just looks different in colors and some shapes and things like that. Um, usually, it takes me one stand set, standalone session at the counter with a customer after I've upgraded them, showing him where their stuff is. That's the important one. How do I get to my documents? Where's my pictures? I all I got to do is show them that. I can even help them by making shortcuts or whatever. And that's usually all it takes. And I don't hear from them again about this is hard and I don't like it. So maybe so, it's like if you hired movers to move you from house one to house two, right? All mm-hmm. your stuff is there, but they put it in the wrong bedroom. Yep. Once they show you, here's your stuff. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. We're good. Now I'm comfortable. Yeah. Different bedroom, yeah. different house, different paint. But at the end of the day, my stuff is still here. We're good. Right. Right. How about Sam, this one? same. Uh, How about I think so. Oh, when, you get a, when you get a brand new car, you don't have the same feel that you had in your old car. You don't really quite know where the buttons are. You don't quite know where the switches are. Right. But you don't go, I hate this car because I don't know how this thing works. you mm-hmm. like anxious to learn about all these new things, right? That's right. That's right. an yeah. excellent analogy that I use with some of my clients right there. Yeah. yeah. You say yeah. model car, newer year. New bells and whistles. It's all it is. So yep. can we start spraying Windows 10 machines with like that new car smell thing? <laughs> My new OS smell. Yeah, that's great. Make it smell good? <laughs> all right, Donna's got this question. Hi, is a fix me stick any good for removing malware and viruses? <laughs> I don't have no, a strong please. opinion. Nope. Yeah. Right. Uh, Sam, you want to shake your head? Uh, you yeah. know. If we all shake our heads, we can say four out of four data doctors say... <laughs> no, there, are too, there are too many viable ways to do that without introducing an, an external source. And if I understand correctly, a, a fix me stick is a, uh, an automated 
thumb drive that you yep. plug in and give control of your system. I'd much rather have somebody behind the wheel for that. It's um, magic is what it is. And and if it's, it's too good to be true. Yeah, too good to be true. Yeah. Very true. Yep. You don't want to. You don't want to take a USB from a, a potentially unknown or not as popular source and put it in your computer and give it permission to access all your files and such. If Fix Me Stick is still around a decade from now, then I say go for it. <laughs> oh, there, wait, 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 wait! There will be a version of the Fix Me Stick. It won't be called Fix Me Stick. And probably, huh? But there's always someone selling snake oil. It's still snake oil. Yeah. Yep, there's no one one quick fix like that. Mm -mm. Nope. Well, and that's the thing. If if things like that worked, think about guys that do this for a living. We work on dozens of machines every single day. If something like a fix me stick actually worked, we'd be that's all we'd have to do is just stick these machines <laughs> these things into each machine and be done. I mean, we wouldn't, right? Right. So there's two things. One, if they were reliable ways to get rid of this, we would use them. Two, yep. if they were we wouldn't have a business. <laughs> right, right, very true. So it's one of those, yeah, too good to be true. So guys, when you're out there in this kind of new world we're in, what are some of the common things that you're seeing people ask questions on? I know a lot of guys in the store tell me one of the number one questions out there is like, how do I do this in Zoom and how's this going? Because everybody's on Zoom. You know, they went from 10 million users a day to 200 million. You know, and so what, what are you seeing out there that, that people are kind of struggling with? What do you got, Sam? Video conferencing in general has you know, exploded over the last couple of months due to the pandemic, uh, not only with people working from home, but students working from home at the same time. So uh, uh, I've had uh, easily two dozen calls in the last month to come by and explain how that kind of stuff works. Zoom itself is, uh, I would put it, Two to three out of ten, Mike. Would you would you agree with that? When it comes yeah. to how tech savvy you need to be with it, um, yep. it's just like anything else. It's new software that people aren't used to yet, and there's a bit of a learning curve with it. But uh, there are plenty of resources around to help you. Uh, whether you need to do a walkthrough on the actual Zoom website on how to use it, or through YouTube videos, or even having one of our technicians come into your home and explain it to you and walk you through it. Um, fairly simple software. Uh, one of those things that is easy when you get to know it. And it's a little too easy, in fact. If you're out there and you decide you want to do your own Zoom session and you think, hey, let me just have all my friends join me, and you put that link on a social media site, <laughs> um, whether it's a public post or not, if that link gets out to somebody that decides they want to come in and wreak havoc, um, this is what we call Zoom bombing. We've seen it. We've seen a lot of that. Um, you don't want to be you don't want to be a victim of Zoom bombing because they'll come in and wreck your gathering. They will use profane language, they will use disgusting pictures, and they will pop it up there. And everybody on your you know I've unfortunately been in meetings with like there were city councilmen speaking, and and it, it was just not a good situation. So wow. if you are going to create a Zoom session, make sure you do look at all the security settings and turn them all on. Or, or you just can also set a password for your Zoom meeting, which uh, I would advise you send separately uh, to all of those people that you want to have included with you. Good suggestion. So Michelle wants to know, is Trend Micro still good? Absolutely. Four out of well, four nurses? Let's address the antivirus uh, security software thing kind of as a whole. At any given time, depending upon who you want to use as a resource, you can have somebody saying this is the number one antivirus. Sure. And best, it may be at the time, too. There's really no such thing as the number one best antivirus, mm -mm. in my opinion. Nope. No, but there's, there's a few that consistently rank high amongst all the major places that test that don't have um, – don't have a financial gain in test, right? So trend generally ranks in the top five amongst pretty much all the major testing companies that do tests that don't have something to gain by doing a test. So I've noticed it, it, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's what we recommend and use. Um, so we recommend for our customers. It's, it's I have it on the computer I'm using right now, uh, my home computer, 
business computers. It's, it's what we use in our business. Um, it's I, I, I wouldn't say it's the only one out there that's really good, but it's one of them for sure. Well, and the other thing is it doesn't do what we see uh, like McAfee, Nort, and some of these others where they just spam you with you need this, you need this other thing, you need, you, shouldn't you, shouldn't you add this to your, you know, I mean, and, and it's just like they're constantly barraging you to try to get new products. Another reason yeah. why we basically love what, what the, the way that they handle things. Yeah. One thing that we like about it in the store that we, we notice a lot when we see a lot of machines come in with other AVs other than trend. And um, one of the things we've noted over the years is that, um, Trend is very light on resources of the computer compared to um, some of the other the big two or three that you would you would know about. Um, those those apps just grab onto your RAM, grab onto CPU usage, and um, can really affect the performance of of the system. And Trend is really really good about that. So where's everybody at on the? Should my Mac have this Trend Micro running on it? Absolutely, absolutely. Every yeah, let's don't fall for the urban myth here of of Macs can't be infected. I see it every day in the store. Absolutely can. And and for that matter, you might think about it on your phone. If you're if you're an iPhone user, maybe less of an issue. But if you're an Android user, there was a time when. You couldn't necessarily trust the downloads and the apps you would get from the Google Play Store, right? That time is probably past now, but there's some vulnerabilities there. That there's there's real threats in the world. If if you're if you're one of a guy like like the guys you see on the screen here, you probably can get by without that kind of protection on some of the less vulnerable devices. But if you're not a pro in this field, there's just so many things that can take advantage of the things you don't know. They can get you in trouble. Um, in this day and age, most of the protection out there for, for devices like phones and things is free um, or very low cost. You start to pay money when you get into computers and things, but generally speaking, the money you spend, you could spend the money for years and years and years in a row, and it'll save you more than it cost you in a couple minutes of something that's bad. So, Here's a mouthful from Christina. So I'm trying to clean up Google Photos. <laughs> <laughs> Seems that many of the photos have many copies. I've searched for a way to find all the copies at one time so I can eliminate all the extras. Do you know a way of doing this? I'm not sure if it's a proper tech question. That's absolutely, that's a, so, that's a very common issue. Before we get into the how um, or the if part, let's talk about Google Photos for people that don't know is something that is something you should have on your phone whether you're an Android user or an Apple user. Yep. It allows you, if you install the app by default, once you've configured it, it will back up every photo and video you take to Google in the cloud for free. And the really cool thing is, have you ever gotten a photo that somebody shared that was on, let's say they're on an Android device and you're on an iPhone and they share it with you or they send it to you in a text message and it looks all grainy? By default, all the stuff is backed up so they can share the link instead, right? which is no longer grainy, it's full, like full resolution, looks good. So it's, it's a cool little backup, it's free, um, and it's just automatic and it's, it's magic. Uh, so let's talk about the duplicate. Since it's, it's free and it's automatic, unless you're worried about it just being quote unquote messy, it's not costing you anything extra for all these duplicate photos. So you, if you're just worried about it just being a clean library, then we can talk about ways you can clean it up. But if, if your real concern is it's just stuff that's taking up space, the space doesn't cost you anything. So yeah, consider right. that. So rather than getting rid of stuff because it's all being presented to you all kind of in this huge timeline, just create an album and put the stuff you care about into those albums. And then you still have those other images as a backup, if you will. Um, so kind of think the opposite instead of getting rid, get, getting rid of things. Just reorganize things. By the way, right. it has some really smart technology where it will look at things that it thinks are like receipts or what would normally be throwaway photos. And it will it will offer to clean them up for you from your device. So it has some built-in kind of smarts for that. 
Um, what also may look like duplicates to you may not be duplicates from a file standpoint. They may be slightly different versions. So, so today on our phones, a lot of us have a setting turned on by default that's a live photo where on some devices that'll actually capture multiple frames that look like duplicates, but they're slightly different. So that may be what you're seeing. Um, there, are, there are pieces of software you can get that will let you clean up duplicate photos or duplicate files for that matter on both Mac and uh, Windows devices, but trying to clean them up in Google's cloud storage, I don't know of anything like that. Do you guys? No, I don't. As far as, yeah, as far as trying to do the cleanup from the Google side, I don't know. Um, that's a tough one. Um, you know, it, it, you, I suppose you could figure out a way to try to clean up on your device side um, and, and then maybe push everything up if you know you haven't deleted you know um, anything that's important but it gets really tricky on a device there's lots of other ways to deal with dupe photos when you're talking about a pc and you have all your photos on your end um and you can then rearrange them and use duplicate finding software and all of that but um yeah i can't think of anything um no, I, that, I i know what christina's talking about because i've you know i've been on google photos forever and i i am a voracious picture taker um and I think, Christina, to me, as far as I know, there's no limit to the number of albums. Um, you can do searches on Google Photos. I don't think people realize you can search. Um, you can put your spouse's name in. And maybe this is the creepy part of Google. But <laughs> Facial recognition is crazy good. <laughs> yeah. So you can say, you know, let's say you took a trip to Portugal. You can type in Portugal in your Google Photos. You'll be amazed how many pictures come up that clearly are from Portugal. Um, or use, uh, they have uh, artificial intelligence that can look at a picture and go, okay, there's a girl with a red balloon. Um, in fact, remember the, the old early reCAPTCHA days, Brandon? Yep. Remember where they make you try to figure out what that, uh, the, the, they present you with a picture and they'd say, um, name as many things in this picture as you can think of. There was a game, in fact, it was where you compete against somebody for 30 seconds. And all they were doing is crowdsourcing people through a game to get them to actually describe what a picture had in it. Yeah. <laughs> and so all of that intelligence lives in Google Photos. So, By the way, she has, she has a follow-up question. Is there a limit on albums? I'm sure there's some kind of limit, but I'm sure the limit's ridiculous. Right. Uh, most computers these days have limits. But the limits are like tens of thousands, usually, or more. So, right. So, generally speaking, Google Photos better than what Apple's offering with their iCloud or Dropbox, that kind of thing. I think for what it does, it is potentially right. It's just using it as a repository for your photos. Uh, both, I would both, say yes. Both Apple and Dropbox have limits, right? So, Dropbox I think gives you two gigabytes for free. Um, to start with, and then you pay for things beyond that. Apple, I think, gives you five. Uh, mm -hmm. Google, if you use their, let them manage the resolution of things, it's unlimited. So right. that, to me, makes them a clear standout. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Video as well, and then there's no remembering to do anything. Um, yep. In fact, if it's critical stuff, you can tell the Google Photos app, which if you're, if you're an iPhone user, you'd want to download that app. It's not on your phone already. But you can actually say, yes, back up my photos over my cellular connection. You know, that normally they don't want to use your data connection. By the way, it works on an iPhone because here's an iPhone and see the Google Photos with one notification in there. So right. it, is. it works in there too. Yep. Yeah, once you set it up, it just automatically, mm -hmm. the default setting is when you get to a Wi Fi connection, it'll back the photos up. Yeah, if and you, it's. Yeah, if right. you care, you want them backed up right away. You can say, turn that off and just do it on my cellular connection as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the good thing is it's not a one-to-one -one sync thing between your phone and what's in Google Photos. So if you take something off of the phone, as long as it's been backed up to Google Photos, it stays in Google Photos and you can clear room off of your phone. And they just be sure. Wizard. They have a little wizard in the app if you want without having to think about it. You can say, you know what? Give me some space back because my phone's getting full. And it will go and clean up stuff that it has backed up that's on your phone that you haven't looked at in a long time. So it's really kind of smart. Like it's, it's a super smart app. Yep. 
So the only downside to that process is that if you, let's say you're on an airplane and you don't have, there's no Wi-Fi on the airplane. Correct. And you want to show the, the person sitting next to you or the one that's sitting six feet away from you in this new world, hmm. picture of your grandchild that's only on Google Photos. That's the one time where you're, you're going to say, those data doctors, darn you. <laughs> I've got another place. If you're doing things and you might have a girlfriend, a spouse, a partner of some sort, keep in mind, everything you take a photo of is backed up to this cloud place. Hello. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. Sandra just wanted to give us a little attaboy. Thanks. This is so helpful. Again, you're folks, we, you know, we haven't done the radio show for, gosh, Brandon, what, eight, I don't know, what, eight, nine years, whatever it is. Uh, oh, well. And, and so we, you know, we're just here. We figured in this time and F, I mean, everything that's going on, we can provide some information, maybe a little entertainment, have some fun. Um, you Don't we still have some of the old radio shows posted somewhere? We don't have some of them. We have all of them. Okay, posted. that's not. Uh, yeah, so datadoctors.com slash radio will take you to, <laughs> oh, look, that's my girlfriend. It, it'll take Hi, Lisa. <laughs> when you're there, you can click on the menu item that says radio program. And I don't even know what the, the newest one we have is probably, uh, we, we can tell you when the last time we were on the air was. Hang on oh, a sec. Yeah. Oh, now he's going to go for it. Do it, do it. So there's there's another example of why we tell everybody the internet is like writing in Sharpie. Uh, yes. Yep. So the, the last episode of the radio show was on April 19th, 2013. So just a few years ago. Um, wow. <laughs> but it is there to peruse all the links, including several hundred radio shows before that, and you can listen to it in its entirety. There's an hour and six minutes commercial free. So Nice. So while we're talking about that, there's a couple things we want to share with everybody out there that's maybe new to, to us. Uh, I know my buddy Jack made it a point to tell his fans that uh, we were doing this. I'm working with Jack on some different products or projects. But um, So if you're new to uh, our organization, we've been providing uh, content on a weekly basis for gosh, 25 years or so. So we have a free help center. You'll see it says free help in our little menu. Uh, and while you're there, uh, the, the newsletter section, if you wanna sign up for our weekly newsletter, this is kind of what you'll see. It's real simple, real basic. Got a couple links, four or five tips, uh, the newspaper column, what have you, um, from that free help center. And, and it's just, you just basically give us some basic info and while we're at it, if you're here in the Phoenix area, uh, during the pandemic, we got involved with the Greater Phoenix Foundation, the Chamber Foundation, uh, to try to address the issue that we're having uh, in this state, which is that close to 100,000 or at least an estimated 100,000 students uh, in the state of Arizona don't have um, the ability to, to go to school online because they don't have a computer, they don't have internet access and what have you. So. We're involved with them trying to get old laptops. And I'm talking, they can be really old folks. They can be 8, 10, 12 years old. They'll work for these students. So if you've got old technology sitting around, especially you businesses that are out there, um, you got stuff sitting in closets, please don't throw that stuff away. If you'll bring them to any of our locations, we're, we're basically wiping all the data, making sure that they're in good working condition. Uh, and then providing them to these students through the Chamber Foundation. So uh, any of the locations in the Phoenix metro area, all 17 of them will take those in for you. If you need a tax receipt, get your tax receipt. Um, but please kind of spread the word on that one. We've, uh, I think we're up to about 1,200 machines that we've um, processed so far with more to come. We've had a few huge donations from some of the charities and school districts and locations out there. So um, yeah, if you can, if you can help out on that, uh, please do. And, I, you know, I, I think we'll wait to see if there's a demand for us to kind of do this on a regular basis. Um, uh, looks like if anybody else has questions, um, go ahead and ask them now. And again, if you do ask a question and we don't get to it while we're on the stream, we'll definitely follow up on it. And by the way, at any point that you have a tech question, you can always ask on our Facebook page. It looks like I'm in the 60s NASA mode here. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of kind of a little pixely, but if you're if you're watching this live, or if you're watching it after the fact, 
and you like what you're seeing, let us know. Because if enough people are like interested in this, we might make this a more regular thing. So, yeah, absolutely. Sure. All right, guys. Hey, thanks for for popping in for joining me on this little experiment. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if sure. people want us to kind of do this on a regular basis. Um, it was fun. Yeah. 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 Maybe next time we turn this into a cocktail hour. Maybe that's maybe more friendly. There you go. <laughs> a little happy hour with your uh, technology stuff. So yeah, I'm gonna take I, a page from. I saw something Jack. about Mike. Mike's gonna play guitar too. Is oh no! Right? Yeah, it's in the comments. If what it's do we have? Right? Outro music? Is that what we need? <laughs> uh, we definitely need rejoiner music. We need like cool swishy sounds. We need all kinds of stuff. So <laughs> Michael, play guitar. Thanks, Lisa. Ken just made it real. Leave it to Lisa. All right. So uh, yeah, and then we'll figure out if it's a, if there's people on the East Coast that you know want to do something like this. Maybe we'll move it to a weekend or something earlier in the day. So, do you want me? To All right, guys. Thanks again. Thanks everybody out there. If you uh, if you need uh, if you need help, ask us on Facebook. We'll do our best to try to help you. For now, it's the Data Doctors signing off. See ya.